Objective number one, rate of return on those assets. First and foremost, above everything else. <coughs> above matters such as going out and finding companies that may not be behaving in the right way or whatever, let's concentrate on getting the rate of return on those assets. Now it so happens that 70 trillion dollars, 70 trillion of assets managed worldwide by asset managers subscribe to the United Nations PRI, Principles of Responsible Investing. We have signed that too. That is what we need to continue to do. We don't need to do more than that, however. It so happens it is good business when you do comply with PRI, <coughs> that's good. But to be officiously going out beyond that, looking for companies to excoriate them in some kind of way, no. We need to concentrate on getting a better return for those assets. And the reason is twofold. First of all, as far as the pensioners are concerned, they need to be sure that those assets have been properly looked after. Second of all, from our perspective as taxpayers, we do not want to be putting any more into those funds than we absolutely have to. Right now, the actually required contribution was $1.2 billion. In a potential budget deficit overall of $2 billion, 1 1.2 is a major chunk of that. That comes about from a legacy problem. The existing uh, economy of the state of Connecticut is actually not bad. Population grew by 9,000 out of almost 3.6 million year over year last year. The year before, it declined by 16,000. That's nothing. <coughs> so we have to be very careful about what the state of the economy is. For example, uh, just within the past uh, two weeks, it was announced that uh, for the first time in 10 years, we have exceeded 25,000 new businesses being created in the state of Connecticut. Now, what can the state treasurer do for this? State treasurer can look at infrastructure investment. Uh, for example, roll on, roll off ships to get big trucks off our roads, develop the port of Bridgeport, rather than all the ports down the eastern seaboard. This is something that can be done collaboratively with other states. There are many ideas here. <coughs> what I'm selling to you is that a lot of those ideas I have already worked on. Investments in technology, investments in solar, for example. I was part of a group 30 years ago that created one of the world's largest solar companies. The large company I was with, BP, sold it off eventually in 2011. They've just <coughs> invested in the solar. Sustainable uh, economic development is something that we can certainly look at. But my point is this, this gray hair, I've invested a lot of time in doing all these things <laughs> over the years. Everybody has ideas about what we can and should be doing. I have the experience to actually put them into practice because I have done it before. <clears throat> what else can I tell you? Uh, how much time have I got? Uh, doing pension obligations. Okay, you need to advertise me on 2032. Some suggested up to 2047. <coughs> we have something rather wonkish called debt defeasance where we can exchange that obligation, which is a pension obligation, which is like any other obligation, like any other debt. Transfer it into debt at 3 or 3.5% three as opposed to the 6.9 or 8% that we're expecting to return on our assets. Um, and uh, then we have the two major things in order to get a better rate of return. It is allocation, how much goes into fixed income, how much goes into equity, how much goes into real estate, how much goes into alternatives, hedge funds and, and private equity. This is something I have done for a very long time. That is an area where we can make a difference. Manager selection. Now, people will say that they've dealt with these fund managers. Only one candidate in the entire field has dealt with fund managers both from the point of view of hearing, to their, hearing their pictures and what they have to do, but much more important than that, seeing what it's like on the other side. Because these are people who invest in companies. Now, I have been in companies who sold stocks and bonds to these investors. So I've seen it from the other side. I know what kind of uh, investing criteria they use. I know what kind of questions they use. And I know from the other side who's good and who's not. If you want to ask me afterwards, I'll tell you. <laughs> and again, an area of expertise that I bring to this situation. Uh, something Denise has done that I'd like to continue. She participates in the um, Municipal Accounting Review Board. It's something was set up by the governor. I think that's a very important aspect of uh, 
uh, getting back to the fiscal responsibility in our municipalities. And I look forward to participating in that as a former CFO, as a former intern auditor, as a former investor, as a businessman, <coughs> I will have a practical role to play on that board, and I look forward to doing it with your help. Thank you. I'd like to thank Aruna and Dita and John for joining us this evening and offer you an opportunity to, uh, to um, exit if you'd like from the, from the panel. And as we begin our introductions for the candidates who are either have announced for Attorney General or have uh, created an exploratory committee looking at the possibility of running for Attorney General. Uh, I'll introduce them first and then uh, give the opportunity for a three minute introduction. Uh, Representative Mike D'Agostino. Absolutely. <laughs> Senator Paul Boyle. Assistant Attorney General Claire Kendall. Attorney Chris Maggie. Representative William Pond. Representative D'Agostino. Good evening. My name is Mike D'Agostino. Thank you for having me. I'm a state representative from Hamden, Connecticut. And in the legislature, I chair the General Law Committee, which has oversight of various aspects of the law, uh, including consumer protection, unfair trade practices. And in my private life, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for more than 20 years in the state of Connecticut, state courts, federal courts here in the state and throughout the country. And I do mostly antitrust law, unfair trade practices law. I also oversee the pro bono efforts at my law firm representing uh, charities and nonprofits. Now, the Office of Attorney General in the state of Connecticut is the state's chief civil litigator. Uh, that office uh, oversees everything from consumer protection laws and unfair trade practices laws to our charities. Uh, so that overlap between my public and private life and what the office does, um, it's not a reason for me. It's a qualification, but it's not a reason. The reason that I've opened an exploratory new statewide office focusing on attorney general is because I believe that office is much more than just about being your lawyer. It's about being your advocate. It's using the law, the awesome power of the law, to advocate for the policies and positions we believe in as Democrats. That's what the job should be and what I believe it should be. Now, what does that mean? Two main areas. First, with all due respect to people running for governor, this position is almost more important, at least when it comes to the Trump administration, because it's attorney generals who are the bulwark, the front line defense against what that, what's happening in Washington, how that impacts that. It's attorney generals that challenge the immigration. It's the attorney general's office that can challenge the repeal of net neutrality. It's the attorney general's office that can sue to enforce the Clean Air and Clean Water Act when it's being ignored by the Trump administration. And it's the attorney general's office that can bring suit to challenge even the repeal of the state and local income tax deduction. But it's more than just the federal level. It's about being an advocate at the state level, advocating policy positions to the legislature and saying, you should pass these laws and I'll defend them in court. Tolls, can you pass tolls without violating the Commerce Clause? Absolutely. Can you close, pass a law to close, to close the hedge fund loophole without violating the federal law? Yes, you can. Can you take back people's pensions that they've earned our state employees over time without violating the Contracts Clause of the Constitution? No, you cannot. That's the job of the Attorney General, to say to the legislature, here's what the law is. Here's the policies you should pass and why, and if you do that, I will be the first one in court defending it. That's how I view the job. For more than 20 years, my clients and my constituents have gotten that from me. Being your advocate, I want to be your advocate for the Office of Attorney General as well. Thank you for having me tonight. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Doyle. Uh, it's my pleasure to be in Glastonbury. I live right across the river, and this is yesterday I was in Greenwich, and then later in Norwalk. It's a pleasure to be close to home. Um, again, my name is State Senator Paul Doyle. I think your next Attorney General should have three qualifications. You should be an experienced lawyer, 
to be spared as a public servant, and he should have a person as, as the courage of his convictions. I've been, a, I've been a lawyer for 26 years in the town of Newington and Rocky Hill. I represent you. I represent people. I'm a small firm lawyer. I represent the problems that you have each day, whether it's uh, closing, whether it's a, uh, some litigation, whether it's a, a probate estate. It's basically working with you in civil courts, criminal courts, and uh, probate courts. So I've, I spent 26 years, and there's really no question from my perspective of whether I'm qualified, whether I have the experience of the problem we had eight years ago. In addition to that, during my tenure as an attorney, I've been a public servant. I'm proud to say I spent 26 years in public service. I was in Wethersfield Town Council for three years ago, a long time ago. I served the State House for 12 years, and now I'm completing my sixth term and 12th year in the State Senate. So I've really dedicated my life to public service. And, and the best way for me to explain what I think public service is is an example that I had a few years ago from a person, a constituent that called me, Janet Nowicki, in connection with her, her father. Her father was an 88-year-old veteran who served us in the Battle of the Bulge in World War II. He was um, a resident of the Newington Housing Authority. I represent the town of Newington for 12 years. But that housing authority intended to evict Mr. Nowicki. And usually evictions are based on non-payment of, of rent and the like. In this situation, the basis was smoking, and it was smoking too close to the building. And, and smoking in his apartment. And we just have to keep in mind that all of us made him smokers because during World War II, we gave all our veterans free cigarettes and for, to get them to relieve the stress. So I was, I first went to the, as state senator, I went to the Newton Housing Authority and tried to knock some common sense into them to say, listen, let's work this out. Let's not leave the litigation. I ended up having to revert that they filed a lawsuit and I therefore defended him in, um, it's an eviction civil summary process court, I was able to settle that. And, and uh, those are the best cases of my career. And the third requirement, I think, for the next attorney general is a person has the, the courage of his convictions. In September of last year, I made a very difficult decision. I made a vote of conscience on the budget. That's an example of where I, I did what I thought was right. That vote ultimately led to a bipartisan budget a month later, which is really good for the state of Connecticut and the Democratic Party. If the budget as proposed by our Democratic Party had passed with significant tax increases, I believe all of us, we would have, we would have had a bad November, we'd lose one or both chambers, the Democratic priorities that we fight for would not be satisfied. So yes, it was a controversial vote, it was a vote of my conscience, but I think ultimately it was the right decision for the state of Connecticut and, and the Democratic Party. So it's my pleasure to be here and thank you very much. Hi, I'm Claire Kendall. I am a candidate. I'm not exploring anything. I am running for attorney general. Um, I grew up in Waterbury. I have uh, my parents were in manufacturing, worked in, in manufacturing in Waterbury. My two brothers are Waterbury firefighters. My sister's a special ed teacher there. Uh, for the past 28 years, I have been an attorney. And for the past two decades, I've been your attorney. I've been an assistant attorney general for the state of Connecticut. And my priority doing that job is the same as my priority would be as your attorney general which is to fight and protect our people in Connecticut. Uh, I have done a wide variety of types of cases uh, in Connecticut. Uh, for the past six years, I've been the department head of the energy unit, and my three lawyer unit has saved Connecticut electric ratepayers over $100 million. But I also have done jury trials in federal and state court and taken, you know, literally hundreds of depositions and lots of legal cases. But what does it mean to you? It means that what I've done is I have the experience for the job. I am the only candidate, Republican or Democrat, who's ever worked in the Office of the Attorney General. I've worked with Richard Blumenthal for 12 years. I've worked with George Jepson for eight years. Um, I know what this office does and what it doesn't do. So. Suing the federal government, I was the lead lawyer on the Child Left Behind case. Uh, suing uh, for, on behalf of consumers, I was a lawyer in the Best Buy case, which was Best Buy at that time had two internet sites, one inside the store, one outside the store, identical in every way, except the site inside the store had higher prices. And they paid a half a million dollar for settlement for that case. I also done environmental enforcement. 
uh, for best for uh, pesticides. Um, I had the largest uh, penalty paid uh, by Terminex for violations of pesticide laws in the environmental world. These are not ordinary times. Uh, the last year's, uh, this last week's uh, news, there's three items that would have been news for six months and we all are passing it by. The government, the president's mistress was paid off by his lawyer. The general counsel has said that uh, we have, uh, you know, it, we have war basically with Russia and then there was a terrible shooting in Parkland. This is not who we are as Americans. This is not who we are as a people. And if nothing else is shown, it shows we need experienced, competent, dedicated leadership. And I will submit that I provide that leadership, and I hope you will, uh, after listening to what I have to say, will also agree with me. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Maddy. I grew up in Windsor. I've spent almost my entire life in Connecticut, except for a couple years uh, after college. And up until recently, I was the chief of the Financial Fraud and Public Corruption Unit for the United States Department of Justice right here in Connecticut, where I supervise a team of over 20 lawyers and legal staff, some of the best lawyers in the country, taking on some of the most powerful special interests in this country every day on your behalf. Hundreds of FBI agents and Secret Service agents and IRS agents working on your behalf. But I want to tell you a little bit about why I became a lawyer. Uh, because it was a surprise to me that I became a lawyer. When I was 15 years old, I was working at the same old bleach company in East Hartford, uh, loading pallets of hydrochloric acid and chlorine and sulfuric acid and bringing them all over the state. So I, I wasn't destined to become a lawyer. The reason I became a lawyer is because when I graduated from college, I became a union organizer working for low-wage health care. Uh, and I was organizing them all over Northern California. They were being exploited. They were being forced to work off the clock. That means they were being forced to work for free a couple hours a day. They were almost all first generation American. They were almost all women. They were the working poor. And I was tasked with going out and investigating what was happening as a 23 year old. Because we were trying to organize them, but we were also trying to build the basis for a class action loss. That's when I first thought. I would be a lawyer. That's why I became a lawyer. And when I came home to go to UConn Law School, I knew I wanted to go to the Justice Department because I was sitting in law school and I was seeing public corruption all over our state. With John Rowland the first time around, state treasurer, big city mayors, all getting paid off to make policy decisions that weren't in our interest, but that were in their friends' interests. And so for the better part of the last decade, that's what I did at the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I know now that we face threats Yes, from Donald Trump, but we face threats from a Republican agenda that has been in motion for years before he even came on the scene. The NRA was preventing gun safety measures long before Donald Trump became president. The energy and fossil fuel industry was preventing uh, adequate environmental protection long before Donald Trump became president. The big banks uh, and Wall Street institutions were hurting consumers uh, and borrowers and investors long before Donald Trump. And so what we need right now is an attorney general who is going to prosecute a case not just against Donald Trump, but the Republican corporate agenda he represents that are ripping people off in Connecticut every single day. And I think you deserve a lawyer who's going to wake up every morning thinking about your family, your kids, your futures. Because, you know, the corporate interests and Donald Trump and his allies, they got the, the best lawyers money can buy. $1,000, $2,000 an hour. But you need a lawyer who's waking up thinking about it. That's the kind of lawyer I want to be for you. That's the kind of lawyer I've been for you. I'm running for Attorney General for that reason. So thank you very, very much. Good evening. Thank you for having us here tonight. I'm State Representative William Tong from Glastonbury. <laughs> My parents live on Chestnut Hill Road. They've been there for almost 40 years. Uh, but the truth is I represent Stanford and Darien now. Uh, after law school, I settled there, and I'm the House Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, but it's good to be home tonight. In my role as the House Chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I have overall responsibility for our state's legal system. And today I was doing my job in the House, Paul and I were doing our jobs, 
and I was doing what I often do, which is uh, lead the debate in confirming judges to serve on our state courts. On Monday, I will help lead the Judiciary Committee uh, in the confirmation hearings for Justice Andrew McDonald, who's been nominated to be our Chief Justice. But I will tell you, that is going to be a battle. Not because Andrew is unqualified, not because Justice McDonald is not experienced, but let's be honest, because Republicans have poisoned the well and have gone after him because he is poised to be our first openly gay Chief Justice in the history of our state. Now I've been criticized, you may have seen in the Hartford Current today, I've been criticized for hitting back really hard and for calling the Republicans out. And I did that because it's outrageous, outrageous to use dog whistle politics in this environment and question the qualifications of somebody who is eminently qualified. And I did that because if you're like Andrew, or if you're like my family, immigrants to this area, or if you're a woman or a person of color, or if you just want peace and health insurance in this state, the President of the United States and the Republican Party have declared war on you and your family. And that's why I formed an exploratory committee for statewide office, including Attorney General, because this is a deeply personal fight for me. We've taken on forces much more powerful than Donald Trump, and we've beaten them. As the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I took on the NRA, wrote the domestic violence gun law to take guns out of the hands of domestic abusers. It is my honor to be one of the architects of some of the strongest gun laws in the nation. I took on the big banks to rewrite our foreclosure laws to help thousands of Connecticut families stay in their homes. And it is my honor to fight year after year to pass critical anti-human trafficking, anti-sexual harassment, anti-sexual assault legislation. And I personally stopped every major encroachment on a woman's right to choose on the Judiciary Committee over the last several years. I mentioned, I mentioned my experience, not just for its own sake, but because this is a moment for the battle tested. Battle tested by George Jepson, Richard Blumenthal, and I hope to earn your support.